You know when we decide to spend five minutes before bed on TikTok and then the next time we look up, an hour and a half has gone by and all we've done is watch videos of dance moves and pranks? Why do we do that? Well, one part to the answer involves the work of pigeons, ping pong, and BF Skinner. Welcome back to Bear It In Mind. On this channel, we explore the world of psychology so that we can better understand ourselves and others. In this video, we are continuing to explore behaviorism, focusing this time on operant conditioning and the research of BF Skinner. This video is part of a series looking at the topic called Approaches in Psychology. Each of these approaches explains human behavior from a different perspective. In the previous video in the series, we introduced the behaviorist approach and explored classical conditioning and the work of Ivan Pavlov. In this video, we're going to explore operant conditioning and the research of B.F. Skinner. At the end of this video will be some retrieval practice of what we cover so that you can check your understanding. Let's dive in. You thought Ivan Pavlov was an interesting bloke with his prize-winning research into dog digestion? Well, wait till you meet B.F. Skinner. Skinner's pioneering work enabled him to teach pigeons to play ping pong using the method of operant conditioning that we are about to explore. In fact, he was even asked by the US government to run Project Pigeon, where he tried to develop a pigeon-controlled guided bomb as part of the war effort. I kid you not. Skinner's background wasn't in psychology, but he had read John B. Watson's Behaviorism and Ivan Pavlov's Conditioned Reflexes, which both served to influence Skinner's research in the 1930s. For Skinner though, the stimulus and response association that we looked at with Ivan Pavlov's classical conditioning was not enough when it came to understanding human behavior. To quote Skinner, behavior is determined by its consequences. Not only that, Skinner said, behavior is shaped and maintained by its consequences. So for Skinner, it's all about consequences. Sometimes there are behaviours that we want people to repeat, like your teacher wants you to hand your homework in on time, the police want you to drive safely, and your parents probably want you to keep your room tidy. So operant conditioning is learning through consequences. For Skinner, when we want to increase the likelihood of a behaviour being repeated, we want to reinforce that behaviour. More on that in a minute. But sometimes there are behaviours that we don't want others to repeat. So that teacher obviously doesn't want you to repeat the behaviour of turning up to their lesson without your homework. The police don't want you to drive at 40 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. And your parent doesn't want you to leave your dirty clothes on the bathroom floor again. These are all behaviours that your teacher, the police and your parents want to make sure don't happen again. They want to decrease the likelihood of that behavior happening again. And they tend to do this by punishing those behaviors. So there we have our first two key terms. Reinforcement means doing something that increases the likelihood of a particular behavior being repeated. So reinforcements strengthen a behavior. Punishments, on the other hand, decrease the likelihood of a particular behavior being repeated. So punishments weaken a behavior. Now it's important at this point for me to mention how Skinner investigated all of this because it become relevant later on. Skinner created a highly controlled setting to carefully study the effects of reinforcement and punishment on the behavior of animals, particularly on pigeons and rats. This became known as the Skinner box. To consider two examples, reinforcement. When the rat was placed in the box, it moved around and would eventually accidentally press the lever, which would release a food pellet. The rat learned the behavior of pushing the lever rather quickly because of the reward, the positive reinforcement of the food pellet that followed. This reward strengthened the behavior of pushing the lever. Punishment. In other experiments, if the rat pressed the lever, they would receive an electric shock. This would decrease the likelihood of pressing the lever again. We're now going to explore different types of reinforcement and different types of punishment. When somebody wants to reinforce a behavior, make sure it's repeated, that person has two options. They can use positive reinforcement or they can use negative reinforcement. And it's exactly the same for punishment. If someone wants to punish a behavior and make sure it isn't repeated, they can use either positive punishment or negative punishment. But what is meant by positive and negative in this context? 
A common misconception students have is that positive always means something nice and negative means something mean, something not so nice. But actually, when we're talking about positive and negative, we need to think about it in terms of maths. Positive means to add something, while negative means to subtract something, to take something away. So let's see how these two terms play out in the example of homework. The behaviour teachers want to be repeated, and I'm speaking from experience here, is for students to hand their homework in on time. So let's imagine Jimmy turns up to his lesson with his homework. Well done, Jimmy. I might reinforce that behaviour by either adding something, some praise, a positive comment on Jimmy's work, or maybe even a shiny gold sticker. Another way I might reinforce this behaviour is to take away something, such as taking away the threat of a detention. I'll say to him, you don't need to stay behind at lunch because you've done your homework. That's negative reinforcement. So, well done, Jimmy. But unfortunately, not all students are like Jimmy. Susie turns up to lesson with no homework. This is a behaviour I don't want to see again. I want to weaken that behaviour and so I need to apply a kind of punishment. I can either add a punishment, positive punishment, such as giving Susie's mum a phone call or giving Susie a stern word in front of the class. Or I can apply some negative punishment by taking something away, such as her precious break or lunch times. So operant conditioning is learning through consequences. Operant conditioning applies to voluntary responses. Now back to a key concept we have mentioned before in discussing behaviourism, extinction. For operant conditioning, extinction is when the behaviour that was reinforced now stops being reinforced. This makes it less likely that the behaviour will be repeated and may eventually cease to continue. For example, if your teacher suddenly stops giving you those shiny gold stickers, then you might be tempted to stop putting so much effort in with your homework and even stop handing it in on time. Linked to the concept of extinction is what is known as schedules of reinforcement. Schedules of reinforcement can have an impact on how resistant a behaviour is to being extinguished. And if you don't think this is relevant to your life, just wait. We know so far that behaviour that is rewarded is more likely to be repeated. However, if we are unable to predict when that reward is likely to come, what will that do to our behaviour? This brings us to a distinction between continuous reinforcement, which is when behaviour is reinforced every time it occurs, and partial reinforcement, which is when behaviour is reinforced some of the time. The problem with continuous reinforcement is that eventually over time the reinforcement has less of an impact. On the other hand, partial reinforcement is more resistant to extinction than continuous reinforcement. So if we want someone to keep doing the behaviour for longer, partial reinforcement is the way to go. So how does it work? Well, partial reinforcement comes in four different types. We're going to consider four schedules of reinforcement. Two of these refer to ratios. When you see the word ratio, just think of number, the number of responses. Two of these refer to interval. When you see the word interval, just think of time. You'll also see that two of these refer to fixed, which means that they are consistent, they stay the same. You'll also see that two of these refer to variable, which means they vary, they do not stay the same. So firstly, a fixed ratio schedule. The reinforcement is given after a fixed number of responses or behaviours has occurred. For example, the rat must press the lever three times before the food pellet is released into the box. Secondly, a variable ratio schedule. The reinforcement is given after a varying number of responses or behaviours has occurred. The number required changes after each reward is given. This is unpredictable. For example, the food pellet will be released into the box after the lever is pressed three times, then next time after six presses, then the next time after two presses. Thirdly, a fixed interval schedule. Reinforcement is given after a fixed amount of time elapses following the behaviour being performed. This can be predicted. For example, the rat would receive the food pellet 10 seconds after they press the lever every time. And fourthly, variable interval schedule. Reinforcement is given after a varying amount of time elapses following the behaviour being performed. This is unpredictable. 
For example, the rat would receive the food pellet 10 seconds after they press the lever, then the food appears 15 seconds after they press the lever, then the next time 7 seconds after they press the lever. Now, out of all four of these reinforcement schedules, which one do you think leads to the most behaviours occurring and is the most resistant to extinction? The answer is variable ratio. If the reward is unpredictable, it will keep you coming back for more. If you don't know what is going to happen in terms of a reward and you don't know when it's going to come, you will keep performing that behaviour. Let's focus on Instagram to see this at work in three ways. Number one, you open up the app and start scrolling through the feed. There is unpredictability in whether you will find something you like that excites and interests you. And then there's the pull to refresh feature, which reminds you an awful lot of slot machines. If I refresh now, what might pop up? Maybe I'll find something I like. Number three, and when you post photos, you are waiting and checking in to see when the food pellet will be delivered. I mean, when you get likes and comments. Your behaviour is being manipulated using the ideas and research of BF Skinner to keep you using their app to steal your attention. So now let's test yourself. Just to check your understanding, I'm going to give you a scenario and then I'll ask you to pause the video so you can decide which type of consequence has been applied in the scenario. Is it positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment or negative punishment? Ready? Here we go. Let's imagine a mother is going for a walk to the park with her small child, Timmy. Timmy's holding his mum's hand but when he gets to a road he sees a little puppy on the other side of the road. He lets go of his mummy's hand and runs across the road to the little puppy. Thankfully, it was a quiet road and there weren't any cars, so Timmy was safe. Whew. But of course, that might not always be the case. Timmy's mother wants to make sure that Timmy does not run across the road on his own again. So she turns to Timmy and says, Timmy, you know you're not supposed to cross the road on your own. That was very naughty. Because you have done that, we're not going to go to the park now. Instead, we're going to go back home. I don't want you to do that again. Which of the four consequences did Timmy's mother apply? The correct answer was that she applied negative punishment. We know that it was punishment rather than reinforcement because she wanted to weaken the behaviour of running across the road. And we know that it was negative instead of positive because something was taken away, not added. His trip to the park. Well done if you answered correctly. If you didn't get that right, don't worry. Let's have another go. It's another day and Timmy's mother is taking Timmy to visit the ducks. Before they set off, she reminds Timmy not to cross the road on his own. So they set off to see the ducks. When they get to a road, amazingly, that same little puppy is across the road. Unlikely, I know. Maybe the puppy's lost. Timmy holds on to his mummy's hand and crosses the road with her. Once they've safely crossed the road together, Timmy's mother turns to him and says, Well done, Timmy. I'm really proud of the way you crossed the road. We're going to see the ducks now, and I'll even get you an ice cream when we arrive. Which of the four consequences has Timmy's mother applied this time? Answer, positive reinforcement. We know it's reinforcement because she's wanting Timmy to repeat the good behaviour of crossing the road safely. And we know it must be positive because something has been added. Praise and the promise of an ice cream. So now let's test your understanding of schedules of reinforcement. For each of the following examples, can you identify which type of reinforcement schedule it is? So now that you hopefully have a better understanding of operant conditioning and the work of BF Skinner, bear in mind how much of your behaviour and the behaviour of those around you may be the result of operant conditioning. And especially bear in mind all those ways that reinforcement might be being used to manipulate your behaviour online. Being aware of how your behaviour is being shaped and controlled is the first step to doing something about it. For more on the other approaches in psychology, check out the links to the playlist in the description below. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.